I'm willing to concede that I'm going nuts. Um, I, I really feel that, um, you know, what's that this, this, this idea of the digital storyteller and the fast paced times that we're living in and the fast paced, uh, environment that we're habitating right now has forced writers and authors to really tighten the screws, you know, and the, hence the micro narrative, you know, that's why it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, um, you know, it's it's something that, uh, you know, forces us to be a lot more careful with our words, Co forces us to really have, you know, every single awareness about us that each word needs to be there purposefully, that no words are frivolous, you know. Um, and again, I novels blow me away. I love novels. I have nothing against novels. Um, but unless you're J.K. Rowling, and unless you're Stephen King, unless you're James Patterson, and you really get a niche audience, uh, I don't know if if a lot of people are reading novels these days. And hence, and 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 again, I don't want to say. I don't want to say that. You know, writing a novel or or writing a short short narrative, a micro narrative, is the phrase that I've coined for for my kind of my books, excuse me. I'm not going to say that, that uh, you know, writing a novel is easy or writing a novel you, you can get more leeway. Um, there, but there's definitely some truth to the fact that writing a novel, um, you know, you, you, you have to put more in there that gives it that sort of breadth. You have to give it the space. You have to give it the, the there's more elaboration that's necessary in a novel. Whereas in a micro narrative or in a short short story, um, you're forced to to really collage your words and really piece every puzzle piece needs to fit, meaning every word needs to have purpose, and there's no room for frivolity. There's no room for superfluous words, and I'm very very pumped about this right here. Very very pumped about this right here. This book sort of spawned from that crisis, the financial crisis, which forced me to, you know, which really, really gave me a lot of stress. I mean, talk about a midlife crisis. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no idea how I was going to make money. I had no idea how I was going to take care of myself. I had never thought I would ever have a family. I'm very blessed to have a beautiful wife. I'm very blessed to have a beautiful, two beautiful kids. But I never saw that coming. I mean, I never saw that coming. Um, during that era of the, of the really beginning of the collapse, it was almost impossible. They weren't hiring professors anywhere. Forget about writing. Um, you know, I was writing for my sanity at that point. Um, it's funny how when you reflect on things too, you really, really understand how lucky you are. You really, really understand the things that you take for granted. And it's really important to have reflection. And that's what that's what writing does. Is writing, writing is dreaming. Writing is love. Writing is, is dancing with yourself. It's loving yourself. It's giving a great big fat hug to your brain and just kind of sitting around a campfire with your own thoughts. Writing is is this beautiful poetic uh, interplay of consciousness, subconsciousness, dream world, awake world, fantasy, reality. And uh, it, you know, it's it's always been my best friend. It's always been my soul companion, my true kind of. Besides my wife, you know, my true soul companion has been my ability to somehow connect my brain with these hands. Um, but maybe even more importantly, somehow how to connect my heart with my hands. I feel like this is something that, you know, uh, this is something that, you know, just kind of took a life of its own. Um, 
And it all started, you know, maybe 10, 11 years ago in the classroom. I'll never forget it. Maybe I can share this little story and then and it might make a little bit more sense. I'll never forget, I was in class. It was when I was really early on in teaching. And it was kind of one of those moments that was really just a eureka moment for me because, you know, I was, when I first started out, obviously, maybe not obviously, but super nervous, super self-conscious, super intimidated by the students. Even though it was a college, and I won't mention the university, if it was one of those, uh, maybe not the most credible universities I started out with, that you see commercials all the time. On t you know, it was, even though it was a college class, it was a college writing class, it was one of those really kind of rudimentary, developmental, basic writing classes. It was one of my first classes. They always give the new teachers those classes. Nothing wrong with that, but it was a very fundamentally basic kind of writing class, even probably having more to do with um, grammar technique and, and form rather than content, which was I felt my specialty was creative content and creative writing. At least that's what I got my degree in. Um, well, that's what I did for a living, which was write fiction and write creative nonfiction. Um, and... You know, I played it safe, played it very safe, just did real kind of... I mean, I could just, you know, real kind of... Um, I started off with real, uh, just narcotizing lesson plans. I mean, the kind of teaching that you sleep through. I mean, I was asleep through it, and I was doing it. And I noticed my audience just kind of shifting, and I noticed my audience, the students could care less and they were starting to fall asleep and some of them were even making excuses to leave and I couldn't blame them I mean I honestly couldn't blame them and I'll never forget it was one day in class and I just kind of shut the book I slammed it on the table I got everybody's attention and it just came out we just started talking about life we just start, I just started talking about things that were bugging me at that moment I started talking about things that were Interesting to me at that moment. I can't really remember what it was. You know, um, a lot of my books have a very similar theme, which is kind of, you know, um, I guess orbiting the question of who you are and introspection, self-inquiry, self-investigation. What are the things that really matter? How to really kind of be your own internal sort of master. Uh, and how your psychological self is sort of the internal Hitler that you need to evict. And, <clears throat> you know, there's no question that, that, that anxiety and depression and, and panic attacks were the norm, were ubiquitous in my life, in my, in my early 20s, uh, mid-20s, late 20s, early 30s. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, just fraught with, with you know, absolute mind terrors. Uh, not uncommon, or n I'm not seeking sympathy or pity here, it just this, those are the things that I was experiencing. And I remember just something happened in class. I, maybe I just felt co like, like the timing was right, or I felt that the audience might have been receptive to it. And it was absolutely invigorating. I mean, it really was, not to make this cinematic... But it was really one of those moments where it just hit me like, wow, this is like, I loved talking about it. The students could tell that I was, the students were just on the edge of their seat. All eyeballs were just completely wide-eyed and, and eager and full of electricity and energy. The room was full of a palpable uh, liveliness, zestiness, gustoness, you know, and... Since that point, I think that was around 2009, since that point, maybe earlier, I can't remember, maybe in a graduate writing class, but since that point on, it's just been this cavalcade of work that's revolved around that, and stories that have revolved around that theme, emotional intelligence, introspection, self-inquiry, self-investigation, who are you, who is the real you? Who is the imposter? And I, it's just, I, I mean, it's almost like a possession takes over. I, I don't even, it's hard to even, you know, kind of 
kind of I couldn't pl- I didn't plan it if that's what your question is Rachel from Virginia it's a great question it just kind of happened it was just kind of and it's just still happening and it's still delightful and it's still enjoyable and I speak about it all the time and I write about it all the time and I talk to my students about it all the time and I talk on social media about it all the time my Snapchat show Nez on Wheels is all about that and I just got to run with it, you know. I got to, I got to go with what's feeling right in here and my intuition. And it's, you know, usually when I follow my intuition, that's never really failed me before. Um, most of my regrets are spawned from denying my intuitive kind of instincts and, and, and thoughts. So I hope that answers your question. And it was kind of a long form. Um, To be honest, it's really, really hard to write an effective, shorter, concise piece or a shorter narrative or a short story that's actually good. It's actually easier. It's actually easier to, you know, uh, um, I don't want to say easier. It's not easy to write a novel, but there's, there's a few things that you can get away with. There's more you can get away with that you can't in a short story. And my kind of phrase that I use is that restriction, restriction forces you to be really, really creative and forces you to really make every word count. Just like the Twitter, Twitter's 140 characters or less really kind of forces you to, you know, um, really be aware of the words you use. And, and, it, it, and, it, and it really, what it really boils down to is it's all about quality, not quantity. That's what it all boils down to. It's all about quality, not quantity. And I feel very, very strong that these micro-narratives are reflective of the times that we live in. Short attention spans, more bang for your buck, you know, writing that you can come back to over and over again, writing that does not take, uh, you know, uh, a million, you know, years to read or a million years to grasp or understand clear concise simplistic you hear this word tossed around a lot a digital storyteller what's a digital storyteller well if you if you're like me who really really believes that social media can do such a mountain of good rather than what everybody wants to kind of criticize and be cynical about that should you look at it a different way you know it just depends on your perspective You know, what I always tell my students, Abner, this is what I always tell my students, you know, you don't need to take a writing class to be a good writer. You don't need to take a, you know, composition course. You don't need to, you really don't. The best education is the public library and it's completely free. You read, read, read. I tell, I used to teach ESL as well. You read as much as you can, read carnivorously, read like a ravaged beast. Download as many as much language and as many English sentences as you can in this thing, uh, and especially if you have insomnia, I always tell my students who were all hopped up on Starbucks. Everybody, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, even though I wake up at five in the morning and start work, and even though I, you know, um, I'm working all day every day, twenty four seven, I still have a hard time going to sleep because this thing's going a million miles a second. Reading is actually a beautiful, beautiful uh, antidote to insomnia, especially English. And I'll tell you why. A very scientific reason why. English, the English language, because of its terse kind of characters and its large chunkiness, and it's as opposed to all the Latin languages and French and Latin based languages and what have you, it's a very kind of rigid type of language. So, what that means is, is it's actually harder for your eyes. It's more exercise, more work for your eyes to read English than it is in Spanish or French or Greek or Latin or Middle Eastern or what have you, Arabic. Um, so you can actually two, kill two birds with one stone. You could actually download, you know, become more efficient, get, get language, absorb language like a sponge, devour language. And I mean, Hemingway never took a writing class. Shakespeare never took a writing class. You know, Faulkner never took a writing class. Emily Dickinson never took a writing class. Well, maybe she did. I don't think maybe she did. 
I'm not sure about Emily. They read. They read their asses off. They read. So Abner, read. Reading is the best antidote. And here I am, a professor, you know, and I'm basically contradicting. This is what I do for a living is teach writing, you know, and I'm basically saying you don't need my class. You don't need my class. 